Welcome back, AP. Welcome back to your flip classroom for the summer, right? And we're now getting into your second flip out of about five, right? We're actually banking on probably having about five of them, and we're going to be diving head first into this stuff, and we're going to be really, really attacking this course so we can have your first test as soon as we get back. Not like the day we get back, but like sooner rather than later, maybe like a week or a week and a half into the semester, so we can really get out of this stuff so we don't have to worry about rushing through any units, and we can go over all of our stuff, right? Now, hmm. I understand the last slip might have been a little bit intimidating, might have been a little bit much where y'all were like, oh man, wow, this is a lot of stuff we got to go over. I got to know that it's like antiquity, middle ages, early, high, late middle ages. I got to know what feudalism is and investiture. That's a huge word that you need to make sure you know because investiture and the investiture crisis is a major, major thing. You need to know that actually this whole thing with popes and kings, this power struggle going between them, papal supremacy, rah, 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 and all this other stuff going on. Also, other key important thing, it's a highlight, square off, star, make it look like it's exploding or something like that. You're going to want to jump back to that list of stuff about Greece and Rome that they donated to history. Uh, philosophy, republic, democracy, art, architecture, all those things. You want to go ahead and just like highlight that, star it, like kind of make sure that it's really easy to find in your notes due to the fact that it's going to be a biggest basis of like Renaissance artists, what they're doing and what they're getting after, right? So but the biggest thing that we left off of when we were talking in our last flip is we were discussing the themes of the early and high Middle Ages, right? The things that both of those time periods have in common is the fact that people aren't that smart by consideration of comparing them to the Romans, the Greeks, and the later Renaissance thinkers, also the other people that we're about to talk about in two seconds. And also, you've got economic stagnation, right? Economic stagnation just simply means this idea that economies are not really rising or falling. They're kind of just at subsistence level, right? So the early and high Middle Ages was really, really revolving around this thing where it's like, they're not getting particularly ahead of the game. Now, really important thing to understand is that when you actually take a step back and you compare the industrialized, not, excuse me, no, wrong word, the non-industrialized Middle Ages to the industrious level of the Eastern empires that were popping around during this time period, it's a very large comparison to make. It's a very good comparison to make so you can understand that the difference between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and why Renaissance thinkers believe they were living in this era of quote-unquote rebirth, right? Now, when I say the East, basically what we're talking about is, let's go ahead and jump over to, if you are ever needing a map reference, DMAPS uh, is a very, very, very good recommendation, a very, very good thing to use. Let's use World in the Oceans, and we're going to be using the... Blah, 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 the Europe and Africa centered world, and we're gonna be looking at this bad boy right down here. Okay, cool. So, looking at this map really, really fast, when you actually take two seconds to really just kind of look at it and take a gander, you have to understand that this right here was the known world at the time, right? So you've got the Middle Ages raging in this general area, right? So you have to understand, you gotta know that, that you have to like, really, really kind of take two seconds, there we go, you got to take two seconds to understand the fact that, bam, you know, all this is going through what you would call the current day or the actual Middle Ages of their time. Now, when you're looking at everybody else, you've usually got this general area of civilization. This is what you refer to as your Eastern empires or your Eastern civilizations, okay? So basically, everything that came out of the quote-unquote the uh, Western world is going to be originating out of Europe, and that's why we discuss the Western civilizations when Europe spread to these different areas and spread their influence, and so we have our Western areas and our Eastern empires, right? Well, the thing that you need to understand is that this body of water during the European... Oh, that is the worst star that I have ever drawn in my entire life. We're going to do it like this instead. We're going to go like a little like... Eh, eh, eh. All right, there you go. That little asterisk right there is the Indian Ocean, okay? So the Indian Ocean is going to be a major hub of economic activity during the European Middle Ages. So while Europe is feeling like this and very, very upset, they're going to be going through a time period of rebuilding after the fall of Rome. Not the Eastern Empires, though. The Eastern Empires of uh, Eastern Africa, the Arab communities, and the Southeast Asian communities are going to be absolutely killing it 
and making more cash money than they know what to do with, right? You have to understand that this Indian, this Indian Ocean trade hub is going to become a very, very important thing because you had different items that were flowing through this area, bringing intelligence and money and economics and growth and intellectual value to other parts of the Eastern world, all the while... The Europeans are over here not getting any of it, right? So they're not getting any of it due to the fact that it's being basically held off in the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine is bringing these things in. It's how they stayed economically viable, while Western Europeans are not actually having the same kind of access to these goods and materials due to their limited infrastructure, right? So when we jump back to this stuff, you have to understand that those different areas, murdering it killing the game, doing a fantastic thing, because from about 500 to 1450 AD CE, which is the same time period as the European Middle Age, Middle Ages, the Eastern Empires are going through what's known as a Golden Age, right? They are going through a very, very, very positive economic time period, particularly when we're talking about Southeast Asia, the African communities, and the Eastern Shore, the Swahili Coast, and also the Arab communities, right? So the thing that you got to understand is that this Indian Ocean trade hub is little to no involvement of Europeans in their Middle Age, in Middle Age, medieval period, unless you're referring to the Byzantinians. The Byzantinians still had access to these trade routes, but they were still getting them at a very, very high price. And with the economic inviability of Western Europe, those people didn't even have enough money to buy these other goods for the most part, right? And you've got all kinds of stuff coming out of this eastern area. You've got silk, salt, gold. Salt at one point that was being sold by the Africans was worth its literal weight in gold. That's how valuable the stuff was because you need salt to preserve food. You also need salt to not die, right? So you have to have it in your diet or else you'll die. So like gold, huge amounts of gold coming out of Africa. The silk being spun in the eastern or the Southeast Asian community. Intercoastal trading being like being uh, provided by the Arab communities who have recently been converting to Islam. We'll talk about that here in a second. Scientific advancement coming from the Southeast Asian communities as well. For example, just something to wrap your mind around is that the Europeans are going to be able to spread all over the world by the 1400s using a very big piece of technology known as firearms. Firearms are powered by gunpowder. Who actually invented gunpowder? The Chinese invented gunpowder, right? And they were trading it through this monsoon marketplace, as many uh, European historians like to call it now, because they used to ride the monsoon winds back and forth every six months to make this like Indian Ocean trade hub more like viable and kind of effective, you have to understand is that those people, these Easterners invented these things, the Europeans, when they hit their Renaissance period, they're going to start to adopt these items, right? They're also, in these eastern areas, going to preserve Greek and Roman teachings as artifacts. Arabs were literally translating philosophy written by Greeks into Arabic, and they would not be translated back into Western European languages until the Renaissance time period or the late Middle Ages when scholars begin to adopt them and then retranslate them from Arabic into Latin into, into other languages, vernacular languages that are going to be used by the Europeans. So philosophy is coming out of this. Algebra, mathematics, literally invented by the Arab communities, the number zero to give an idea of accounting and to also be able to create basically a number sphere of if I have nothing, can I have less than nothing? If I have less than nothing, that means I owe you something. We're talking about intense accounting systems. Some spices being traded over this stuff all the while what's the Europeans look like over in Europe you know what I mean and then everybody over here is just going ah and they're doing a great job right so you need to understand a lot of this is also going to begin to rub up against the Europeans when you have the spread of the Muslim kingdoms, right? So the Muslim kingdoms are going to begin to expand dramatically around 700 AD slash CE, and it mainly has to do with the fact that they were unified under one religion by a prophet by the name of Muhammad, right? So Muhammad comes along in about 610 AD and brings with him the third major monotheistic religion that exists in our world today. Well, not the third, it's actually the second by population, but third in the timeline because it goes Judaism, Christianity, and Islam when it comes to time and order of occurrence. But Islam is going to unite all of these Arab tribes together after a lot of struggle on Muhammad's part and stuff like that and having to return with an army and destroy like this big temple and everything and these big statues that got thrown down, it's now called Kaaba. But anyway, once Muhammad united the areas of Saudi Arabia and especially in Mecca together, this 
influence and religion began to spread and then unite all of these other Bedouin tribes and Arab people together. And what are they going to do in their unification? They are going to adopt Southeast Asian intelligence. They are going to adopt mathematics. They are going to grow and go through what is known as the Muslim Golden Age. And they are going to spread all over the place. The Persians converted to Muslim, or like to Muslim and Islam, to the nation of Islam, and so they're going to expand in this direction. And then there's going to be a massive expansion through North Africa, and literally the richest man in the world converted to Islam, and his name was Mansa Musa, and he's actually an African, right? So the very, very wealthiest man in all of history was an African man, right? And he was a part of this massive Eastern Golden Age, right? And the Arabs even continued to spread up into Spain, South Spain, Southern Spain, and Portugal. Very important to understand this. You need to know that this is actually a part of, I believe, the Umayyad Caliphate, right? So you need to remember that the Muslims spread into Southeast, or not Southeast, into Southern Spain. And as you can see right here, this is what it looked like during the, like, 500 period, or not 500, from 700 to 1450, this is what Arab community marketplaces and bazaars looked like, right? Look at the architecture, look at the meeting of the minds, look at the collective people, look at the actual organization of social class systems, as well as trading coming in on the backs of these camels through these Bedouin tribe members. So you have a very intense economy going on on the eastern side, while as in the west in Europe, it's not looking so hot, right? So granted, you're going through the high Middle Ages now and the economies are beginning to return. However, something you need to understand, look at all of this advancement. The reason why Europeans are not advancing nearly as fast is mostly due to the fact that most of the money, jot this down, jot this down with a little star next to it, most of the money is locked up in the manorial slash feudal system, right? Those lords and nobles are hoarding the money for themselves, preventing it from spreading to other Western European people and other like smaller merchants and peasants and outsiders. And this is not a true capital system, whereas capitalism was growing and very, very effective in the Arab communities, giving them a lot of prosperity. Now, check out this architecture right here. You see this archway right here, this Islamic style arch. You can actually even see them in Andalusia, Spain, in the south of Spain, and major different artifacts. There is so much Muslim architecture and Islamic style architecture in the south of Spain to this day, right? So you can actually see their spread and you can see the monumental things that they erected and how they spread their influence into this area. And ironically enough, when they spread their influence into this area, it is when some of these famous historians, St. Thomas Aquinas and other ones like him, are going to begin to readopt all of the teachings of these Greeks and Romans and knowledge is going to slowly eke its way back into Europe, right? So when we're really thinking about this then, if we just took two seconds to look at the Eastern Kingdoms and we're kind of taking our a second to wrap our minds around the idea that, wait a second, with prosperous economics comes prosperous intelligence. Now, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. You can have intelligence without the other and you can have money without the other. I mean, like, there have been a lot of wealthy, dumb countries, but, like, I'm just talking about more along the lines of, in this particular era... What was the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance truly? It's a return of money. It's a return of intense economics. It is a return of money moving its way through an area and spreading through trade, right? So where is this going to start? How is Europe going to go from struggle bus central in the medieval period to being rolling in their own dough and rolling around in this intense Renaissance era and all of this money coming in? You have to understand it through this lens is that it's mainly due to the fact that Italian commerce, finance, and banking is going to return, okay? So just so you understand in the high Middle Ages, Middle Age money was typically made through three things. One, land holdings, right? You actually held equity in your land and that was a representation of of your wealth, right? That la literal land holding and your like coat of arms and your everything was representations of your wealth in a sense of land holding, right? You also had taxation, which is how kings and monarchs made most of their money. But due to the fact that nobles usually provided protection and farming and labor service, or not labor services, but areas for like serfs to live on, they're not receiving taxation in the same manner. But also you have a small amount of trade going on. 
Well, what's occurring though is capital from these nobles is being reinvested, okay? So profits are beginning to grow, but the thing about it is, is the massive gap between the wealthy and the poor is growing rapidly. Like I said, the feudal system and the manorial system are hoarding all of this money to themselves during the Middle Ages. That is why that for a thousand years, so many people in the Western European areas were unable to advance as rapidly as, say, the Eastern kingdoms during their Golden Age periods. Now, not to say that there wasn't a massive gap between the wealthy and the poor in the Eastern kingdoms as well, because there was. There was just more lateral movement and entry into intense capitalistic or capitalist economics that were actually in their kind of infant state in those Eastern kingdoms, right? So since capital is being reinvested, it's being held on to in the same place. But during the high middle ages, commoners begin to realize the reason why they cannot make money independently is because they do not have enough resources, right? So commoners begin to join together and create these, right? So jot that word down, highlight it, circle it, make it look like it's exploding. It is literally, basically, in an essence, the very, very first organized, unified systems of labor, right? So, hmm, Karl Marx would love these things, in essence, anyway. Now, so, the rise of guild systems during the high Middle Ages are going to come along when many serfs and peasants are going to begin to realize, wait a second, the reason why I can't make any money is because I'm not necessarily very good at anything, right? I need to be a professional, an expert, an artisan at something. So I'm going to go apprentice underneath this skilled master, and I'm going to learn from him how to do these things. And when he's taught me, I'm going to work in this guild, and we will unite together, and we are going to set prices on our product, right? This creates independent wealth. You could say that this is the baby version of capitalism growing in Europe, right? They're witnessing what's going on in the Byzantine and in the Eastern empires. And they're like, we got to organize together. And so guilds are groups of professionals, skilled workers that united to protect and set a price for their product to avoid unjust taxation and fines, right? Because with this unification, they can create a standard of labor, right? That all men know how, if I'm in a smithing guild, right? Like a blacksmith's guild, we all know how to do X, Y, and Z. I know how to ferry. Ferry means to actually like remove horseshoes and actually reshoe a horse and make the horseshoes myself. That's what a farrier does, right? Who would be a part of a smithing guild. You had carter's guilds, which were guys that like separated wool. You had, not yet, not yet. I'm getting ahead of myself. I was going to say printer's guild, but not yet. Don't get too excited. The printing press is coming. It's a little bit later though. Had a big fan, Angelina Murphy. If you, I don't know if you're stumbling upon this for any particular reason, big printing press fan. Now, anyway, so big things you need to also understand though as well is that they're having different guilds for everything. There were cobbler's guilds, which made shoes. There were all kinds. Those are craft guilds and different things like that. So the big two types of guilds, as you can see, that I'm talking about are merchant guilds and craft guilds, right? So craft guilds are people that make things and merchant guilds are people that sell things, right? They go to the craft guilds, they get these things, they move them great distances and they sell them, right? At a marked up price so they can make the profit. Now, out of major curiosity though, let's see if one of y'all can figure this out. Out of those of you who are watching this right now, which of these two guilds do you think are gonna grow the fastest? Which one's gonna make the most money, the most quickly? Good job, Jordan Hayes. So proud of you. That is exactly right. Merchant guilds are going to grow very, very fast. And the reason why is because they do not require the same amount of goods or things or people or labor as a craft guild does, right? Now, something to remember, though. Something to remember. During the High Middle Ages, guilds are small. They're, like, kind of finite. They only exist in major cities. And however, almost all of the wealth is still residing in the hands of kings, feudal lords, and the church, right? Those three powerful groups of people that ruled over Europe for over a thousand years. Monarchs, the church, and your lords, right? And they still hold on to most of that money, but the guilds are growing, right? So, and since they're growing, they're having the ability to make money and have it on their own, and then also be able to reinvest it into their own capital gains that is not 
heavily involved around land, right? So merchant guilds, how do they make their money if they're growing so fast? Well, the biggest thing they do is they import and they export those Eastern European goods that we were talking about. Now, I'm not saying necessarily they're importing algebra, you know what I mean? Like, that's not really how this is working. You're not importing math, like, would you like to buy some math? Like, it doesn't really, really work like that, okay? Now, what they're doing instead is they're actually importing these other goods that are hard to come by inside of Europe. You got things like Chinese porcelain, which no European could figure out for the life of them how to make until the seven, late 17, early 1800s, when one person finally learned how to make it. He was a German scientist, learned how to make European-style porcelain, and it was still garbage by comparison to Chinese porcelain, right? So they were importing Chinese porcelain. They're importing spices from the Arabian and Indian subcontinents, right? They're importing silks, which are considered like the highest quality textile that anybody has ever seen. Oh, and by the way, it's made by a worm. They're all mind blown by this. Another really big one, huge one, Tea. Tea. Tea coming from Southeast China, right? So tea was becoming a major export going into these different areas. And the greatest thing about all these things is that they are luxury items, right? They are considered luxury to the Europeans anyway. Southeast Asians didn't consider them luxury because they had such access to them, right? Well, the Europeans don't. Spices don't grow there. Silkworms can't live there. Porcelain can't be made there. Tea doesn't grow there. So it's a luxury item. So the merchant guilds are growing their wealth very, very fast when they begin to import and export those luxury items rather than just things coming out of craft guilds, right? And what's the greatest thing about all three of these? Warehouse inventory. That's right, this stuff doesn't go bad, right? So it does not spoil the same way that other things do, right? Porcelain is not gonna go bad. Silk is not gonna go bad. Spices can last for years on end, and they didn't even need to go into the warehouse because they got bought up so fast. Tea is a dried leaf that, if sealed properly, will last for years, right? So warehouse inventory, these merchants literally can create supply and demand on their own, right? But then, this is all in the high Middle Ages. So you've got these merchant guilds just slowly bubbling up. And most of the wealth is still being held on to by the kings, the church, and the lords during the High Middle Ages, right? Something you need to understand, still very important. High Middle Ages, most of the money still resides here. But then, something's going to happen. <laughs> so what's going to end up happening is the late Middle Ages are going to come along. And the late Middle Ages is going to take those three big figures, the church, the nobles, the kings... And it's just going to start bleeding them of their money. And that money's just going to start falling and falling. And it's going to start sifting out into the rest of Europe because of the terrible, obscene tragedies that befell the late Middle Ages. So the late Middle Ages is mostly defined by terrible and tragic events. Hence why it's called the late Middle Ages instead of the awesome Middle Ages. Because like if you look at the high Middle Ages, it's denoting the idea that it was a time of prosperity, right? Now, ironically enough, when we look back on this, we look on the late Middle Ages with a little bit of a different lens in the sense of bad things happen, but positive results came. And we'll get to that here in a second. But some of these terrible tragic events include things like climate shifts, right? The beginning of this thing known as the Little Ice Age started, which brought a lot of rain, killed a lot of crops in the 1300s, and actually caused famine throughout different areas of Europe, right? Actually, from 1315 to 1317, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% of peasants in English villages starved to death, right? Due to climatological shifts that were happening, and also due to this whole thing known as, like, like this, this medieval cooling period, as it's known, right? So, really interesting thing also, is that just ended, like, a little bit a while ago. But so now... And we're making it a lot worse. But like the big thing, though, going forward, though, also, you've got famines, like I said, in 1315 and 1317. You've got massive wars breaking out between nobles, right? Noble families are going to war with one another to create more land holdings for themselves. And also due to these other things known as like secession crises and like all these other different issues going on when rulers and kings die without heirs to thrones and so other noble families want to be the strongest noble family to then install their children on the throne. One of the biggest examples of those conflicts between noble families has to do with this thing known as the Hundred Years War, which literally started in 1337 and then lasted till 1450... I know some of y'all are like, wouldn't it be 1437? It was actually 116 years. Thank you very much. Just give me a second to do the math. 47... 
1453. <clears throat> All right, so anyway, yeah. So the 1453 is when that finally ends, the Hundred Years' War, between France and England. You know a very famous patron, or patroness, we could call her, from the Hundred Years' War, Joan of Arc. Saint Joan of Arc fought in the Hundred Years' War for France, right? Helped turn the tide in the direction of the French, and the French are going to eventually win. The Black Death is going to hit Europe in 1347. Make a little note of that. Put a little date right next to that. 1347, it's going to hit, and it's not really going to leave Europe until the mid-1700s. Very important that you know that. The bubonic plague popped up repeatedly throughout Europe for hundreds of years, all right? And it's not actually because of the rats. It actually has to do with the fleas on the rats, and then the fleas jumped off and bit people, and that's how people got the plague. Also, you got it mnemonically if somebody was like, <coughs> and coughed out, and that's why we wear masks, but <coughs> and they would actually cough and like shoot blood particle particulate out that had bacteria inside of it. And you would, <coughs> there were two ways to spread the plague, fun fact. Now, Babylonian captivity, that was another major one. This is a church controversy, right? Also known as the Great Western Schism, when there were multiple popes. There were literally several popes all at once. You'll talk about this in religion as well. You will actually discuss this with Mr. Mathurin this year when you talk about Babylonian captivity, also known as the Avignon Papacy or the Great Western Schism, was literally when there were multiple popes. And that's going to last from 1378 all the way up until 1414. And a lot of it has to do with this whole thing where it's like Italians wanted an Italian pope and then he wasn't very good. And then they were like, we don't, just kidding, we don't want that one with that French guy, Clement. And then Clement is going to create a papacy in France and he's going to be the French Pope or the anti-Pope, and then there's going to be a Pope in Rome. And at one point, there was even a Pope in, like, Germany. There was a German Pope, and there was this, all this other stuff. And as you can see, there is literally these giant schisms and these big political alliances going on. Which Pope do you like the most? Everybody in blue, like the Italian Pope, everybody in this little kind of goldenrod color, I will call it, um, is going to like the German Pope, and then everybody in the pink color like the French Pope, right? So as you can see, there were different popes, and there's not that's not going to end until 1414 when they actually combine back together, and they go back under one main patriarch. The Crusades are going to break out, and they're going to be absolutely ridiculous, and they're going to start in 1100, or like, like yeah, 1100? 1100, 1100, yeah. So they're going to start in 1100 and rage all the way up until the 13s, and so the Crusades, actually there were nine of them. There were nine Crusades. Nine of them, which is bananas. And that's actually going to be going against Muslim empires that have recently, oh, I don't know, unified, and they have more stuff than you, and they're smarter than you now, and they actually have more money than you. So who do you think won that in the long run? The Muslim empires won all of them except one. And the first one you can't even really necessarily count because the Christians just came in there were like, there's a fort, no, it's ours now, we win. And so there's a lot of different things going on, but all the Crusades are fighting over the Holy Land, and it's also going to leave or underneath the Crusades. I need you to jot this down. The Crusades left the Byzantine very, very weak and susceptible to invasion, okay? So you're seeing the dying of the Byzantine with the Crusades, and you're seeing the growth of Western Europe during this transitional moment, right? So the biggest thing about it is, though, is after all this stuff happened, something crazy went down. As a result, economics did not fall. They exploded, right? So they went forward and like great giant leaps in economic diversity and economic growth happened after the late Middle Ages going into the Renaissance because they did so many important things. The late Middle Ages tragedy, granted it killed millions of people, right? So like you're talking about famine, Black Death, wars, uh, schisms between popes, and wars based off that, and other wars based off that. And so you're talking about millions of lives lost. But what it did is it disrupted that manorial system. Now look, the manor system and the feudal system, same thing, okay? Same thing. We just call them two different things, mainly based on the fact that the feudal system, when it's in, when it is an essence of a large umbrella, and the manorial system is going to be the thing that it's based off of. The manor system is like, oh, there's a big house, and then everybody lives here, and there are fields and stuff. Like, so that's the manorial system, right? So manorial, feudalism, same thing, right? So that'll probably be a great review question when you come back. Now, that disruption, their serfs were dying from plague, their vassals were dying in wars, all this other stuff. Nobles are going to lose money when all these things start happening. Money doesn't just get set on fire. When you have a capital system, and particularly when you have a capital system based in literal tangible, like in tangible precious metals during the Middle Ages, like gold and silver and other things like that, they don't just disappear. Just because the nobles lost them, it's not like they were just like, oh, flower, like, and they just went away. What happened to them is they began to pilfer themselves out into the hands of these merchant guilds, 
guilds, craft guilds, because their services are needed to keep these manors running, right? The disruption of the church led to the papacy losing money. Since people are making less money in mass, that means that they're not donating as much money at mass. See what I did there? <laughs> now, the big thing, though, you got to understand is the tides are going down. If the tides are going down, that means the money is, again, moving its way into the hands of other people in the continent. Also, now that we have less people, you've got smaller markets. If you have a smaller market, it means you can charge more for your goods. That means you have keener competitors, right? So you have people actually being like, okay, I got to either charge more for a better quality product or I got to bring my price down to sell this, this different product. And you also have higher wages. Less people, you can demand more for your labor, right? Which means more people are making more money. So the money left this group, left the kings, left the nobles, left the papacy, and began to slowly spill its way into the hands of regular Europeans. And so the late Middle Ages is the trigger. If the late Middle Ages is the trigger, the Renaissance is the gun, that first fire is going to be the reason why we catapulted ourselves, I'm using a lot of weapon imagery right now, catapult ourselves into the period known as the Renaissance, right? And you have this explosion happening. These are new economic models. So write that down as a title. These are new economic models. You've got new trade routes coming along and new ships. These things designed called caravels are lighter, smaller, and can sail into the wind by the 1400s. And they can actually make new trade routes and they can go different places and different seasonal ideas. They stole this design from the Arabs. Um, so the multi-leveled trade systems with sedentary merchants and resident agents, which is another big thing. You had, so sedentary merchants and resident agents basically meant that you had someone here that would receive your good you here that sent the good, and then you had a middleman, also known as the commendus system, that would carry the good. And all three of you are making money along the way, right? So you've got family firms popping up. So you have the nobles of economics, because let's be honest. Are rich people going to infiltrate everything whenever something becomes cool? Yeah, exactly, right? You had these people and these families that made so much money that they got so powerful that they basically became the lords of these new economic systems. Two big ones that are really, really important to bring up, the Medici and the Sforza. And we'll talk about them here in a little bit in your next flip, okay? You got those family firms popping up. Your warehouse inventory, like we talked about already, you have non-perishable goods that can be shipped at any time of year. You can also create supply and demand. You can actually hold on to things and say that this product is now scarce, and then you can slowly pilfer it out for a higher, like, good or higher rate, right? They used to do it all the time. They would actually literally control markets by saying that they were in a scarce moment. Actually, it's how New Orleans got profitable. When New Orleans actually, like, as a colony, started making a lot of money in the 1700s, it's because they began to, like, literally hoard this stuff known as indigo, which is used as a dye back in Europe, and they would hoard onto it and wait for other markets to have bad harvests, and then they would be like, oh, well, we only have a little, so it's going to cost you a lot. And, like, so it actually is a very, very intense thing. You also have the rise of new financial techniques, right? People are going to make money and do different ways. The double entry bookkeeping is going to be a big thing, right? It's actually the origin, double entry bookkeeping is the origin of the, the holiday named Black Friday, right? So when you say Black Friday, it comes from the idea of double entry bookkeeping. Because when you're in double entry bookkeeping, you have to write things down as he owes me money or I know he gave me this money. And you write everything down that he owes you in red. And you write everything down when you're making money in black, right? And that's double entry bookkeeping. And the reason why we call Black Friday Black Friday is because most businesses in the United States, of course, major corporations actually operate in the red for most of the year. And then a lot of them actually go into the black where they begin to make their profits right after Thanksgiving, right? So bang, Black Friday, you're welcome. Renaissance tie-ins, European history everywhere. Now, the other big thing about it, you have credit and loans as well, right? So I can believe that you're going to owe me this money. And with a loan, I can charge you interest, right? You owe me money for this money. It's really interesting when you think about it that if you have enough money, you can make money off that money. It's a very, very intense thing. Bills of exchange, which means receipts or documentation of a sale sold good to make products more tangible, right? Also, money lenders with interest, you get the rise of banks, right? And the biggest one is going to be the Medici's, right? And, and the Medici's will bring up again a little bit later or a little in the next flip when we actually get to Florence and we talk about them. And I can't wait to show you some pictures of places that you'll see if you decide to go on the trip with us this summer because we're actually going to be going to Florence. We're going to see the Medici's house and it's going to be nuts. All right, so now, but the big thing though you have to understand also, ah, uh, the big thing you have to also understand is that politically speaking, things are getting very, very tumultuous. The government during the Middle Ages is being disrupted during the late Middle Ages, okay? Because feudalism and the church are the two biggest 
power runners. Kings had a lot of power, but they were mostly a part of that feudal system, right? Because they were just basically the biggest lord. Right? So now, feudalism in the church, you're going to start to see the growth of nation states, though, growing under kings, right? So with this, though, the church is very powerful. They're still struggling to fight powerful battles and ideology, 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 ideological, idea. Ideological. Yeah, that word, all right? So church, the, these battles of these ideas are going to be going on, and the church believed that it was a universal guiding government, and it, and it wanted to exert that force in Europe, right? And there's actually a very, very big important thing that you need to understand. This is all invoked by this idea known as the donation of Constantine, right? So apparently, according to church doctrine, there was a letter, right? A letter written by Constantine himself, the, the Roman emperor that made Christianity legal in the Roman Empire, who basically gave the Roman stamp of approval to Christianity. He believed, or the church believed, that Constantine wrote a document, and they had it in their possession, and that that document said that all ruling power of the former Western Rome would fall under the, the guide, guiding light and the papal authority of the Pope, right? And that's where a lot of the popes exerted this papal suprematic power, right? They were like, oh, well, look, Constantine himself said we're supposed to be ruling over the kings, and the kings rule over their nation states. So you have a lot of government battles going on, and what's the best thing? Write this down. If the governments are feuding with each other, that means those merchants are still making lots of money. Because if you're fighting you, and you're fighting you, and you're fighting you, I'm in the background making money, and you're not even having the gall to pay attention to me. Like So you've got large economics booming in the background. And this is what Europe looked like at the dawn of the Renaissance, right? At the dawn of the Renaissance, you had a few major kingdoms popping up, feuding with the Pope, nobles like carrying out armies and trying to take over different places. But your big places are, of course, England, France, the Holy Roman Empire, the Papal States, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, and Spain. Those are your big kingdoms, right? Your kingdoms. But the thing about it is, is these kingdoms are not making as much money as they could be because they're too busy arguing with each other. Now, if they're arguing with each other, that means little guys can start making more money. And this is the best example of what we're talking about. While the government feuds are going on between the Papal States, the nobles, and the kings, You've got smaller areas making tons of money and growing very rapidly, right? And mainly, as you can see, this is another example of what I'm talking about, these wars between these different areas are going to weaken the church. They're going to weaken the papal states, which basically that literally means this country of the church. There's this big middle chunk inside of Italy known as the papal states during this time period, and the pope was literally their king. Like, that's what he was. Like, he actually had an army. He would hire mercenaries from Switzerland, and he would go and off and fight wars. Julius II that you're reading in Michelangelo and the Pope's ceiling, he's one of the biggest ones that ever did that. He was literally called the warrior pope, right? Literally called the warrior pope. And I love that one one like uh, one engraving that Erasmus did of him saying that he's going to have to wait outside of heaven's gate with all the list of things he did wrong. It's like a reverse Santa Claus. Now, the really cool thing, though, is that these wars are ex an example of these things called the Gelfs and the Ghibellines, where li literally the Ghibellines supported the Holy Roman Emperor and the Gelfs supported the Pope. There were wars going on between kings and popes and lords and nobles and all this different stuff, leaving them very weak. This lack of power left room for the growth of three very particular northern Italian small states, Venice, Milan, and Florence. They grew so rapidly, and in the background, while everyone was fighting each other, now granted, some historians will argue, like, well, a lot of the Gelfs and the Ghibellines came from these places. Shut up. All right, so I'm talking about the merchant guilds and the growth of the economic systems in these areas. So, the Ven but these smaller groups and these smaller, more concentrated urban areas in northern Italy grew very rapidly. Venice, Milan, and Florence. And in the next flip, we are going to start talking about Venice, Milan, and Florence and how they made all their money. We'll see y'all then.